received acclaim throughout time. The first documented Miss South Africa was Winnie Commons in 1926. In 1910, four beauties represented South African women in a majestic pageant to celebrate the union. In 1948, the then Prime Minister, General Smuts, crowned Avalyn McCaskill as Miss South Africa in the Johannesburg City Hall. Early Miss South Africans were chosen by public voting and judging of photographs in the press as well as audience applause in dance halls and cinemas. Today, computers keep score and Miss South Africa's coronation is a spectacular TV pageant. The Miss South Africa contest has thus far produced two Miss Worlds, a Miss Universe and a further nine girls placed as princesses. Our previous racial laws only allowed white girls to enter this competition and this racial discrimination resulted in South Africa being banned from taking part in the Miss World pageant from 1977 until 1991. This documentary salutes those who reigned as Miss South Africa from 1953 to 1994. Some you may have forgotten or never known. In our search to find what happened to them, it was discovered that many made it in the wider world, while others, mostly by choice, faded into obscurity. Now meet some who reigned during these past five decades, like Ingrid Mills, Miss South Africa 1953, who owns these stunning legs. We didn't have any crowning ceremony, which I missed. I went down to the office to see Mr. Stodel, and he said, congratulations, you missed South Africa. And that's how I was told. I wasn't crowned. I didn't have all the ceremony that, you know, oh, you know, all that sort of desire. <laughs> I was the last Schlesinger organization, African Consolidated Queen, uh, Beauty Queen. And then um, there was a lull, and then the Sunday Times took it over. The great Universal International Studio of Hollywood are hanging out the welcome sign for a girl in South Africa. The winner of the Hollywood Beauty Contest, organized by African Consolidated Theatres Limited. African Consolidated Theatres Limited are giving the public the opportunity of making their selections. Preliminaries are being judged in cinemas throughout the Union. There's still time for you to enter. Someone must win, it may be you. In 1954 and 1955, no contest was held and Norma Foster was crowned in 1956. Lovely Adele Kruger followed in 1957. I was taking French lessons with a German professor and his daughter was a photographer. And she said she wants to take a few photos of me so that she could send it to a photographer's competition. <laughs> So I posed for them and she took them and then a few months later um, the journalist from the Sunday Times phoned and said I was a finalist in the Miss South Africa. <laughs> I couldn't believe it, it was the last thing I expected. And then my mother was horrified, you know. <laughs> so anyway he said he wanted to come and take some more photos because those weren't very good. So I, I, then I, I, by then I got used to the idea and then he came and took photos and the next thing I heard I'd won it. You know, there was no pageant like there is today. Adele Kruger scooped third place in the Miss World contest. She fulfilled her dreams of modeling when Miss World sent her to Paris. And although she was courted by many men, she never married and now lives alone with her cat and cherished memories. And then Penny Coolan, who became our first Miss World. There was no pageant as as is today. Girls entered their photographs and uh, were chosen by public vote. De Lundstein and the Sunday Times were the, um, you know, the sponsors of this competition. And so I was met by Pete Bukas, who was the editor of De Lundstein at that time. He phoned me up and said, Penny, you are the new Miss South Africa. So it was really as easy as that. I didn't have to go through any uh, parading in front of judges and you know all that sort of thing that the poor girls have to do today. It certainly changed my life. Um, obviously, having been chosen Miss World opened so many doors for me. And I think there must be a huge big difference between Miss World and being Miss South Africa. After all, you're now representing, you know, the world beauty. And um, it's been absolutely the most amazing experience. In fact, you know, 40 years down the line, or even 41 years now since I won the title, I've had so many wonderful experiences and opportunities and invitations, which I probably would never ever have had had I just been Penny Coon. <laughs> Miss South Africa, 1959, Moya Mika. Her pilot father flew her to London for the Miss World pageant. I went back nursing um, in my 40s to finish the training that I hadn't finished when I won the competition. I was actually 
nursing a patient when they came and told me I was in South Africa. That wasn't very easy because there were a lot of people in the fraternity that didn't think it was the right thing for a nurse to have entered and won a competition. And when I went back, I found it was difficult for my tutors to relate to who I was because they knew who I was. And so there was a role conflict. I wasn't just a student, I was Miss South Africa, ex Miss South Africa, and I was a student. What was I doing back nursing? 1960s saw Denise Muir representing us at Miss World. She died in 1992. Yvonne Hulley won the title in 1961. Her successor, animal lover Yvonne Ficker, came fourth in Miss World 1962. I entered Miss South Africa because I'd been a model and I wanted to carry on my career and persevere in the uh, modeling thing. I won the contest went to England and was a finalist in the Miss World contest. When you came back, you were forgotten. You had done your stint as the Miss South Africa. My successor, I never met. There was no crowning for the Miss South Africa in those days either. Auburn head bank clerk Louise Krauss was crowned in 1963. Beautiful ballerina Vedra Karamitas tragically ended her life. Carol Davis represented us in 1965. Clinical psychologist Joan Carter talked to Oxford students about beauty in 1966. For me, it was a great honor to represent my country, to go to, to London, to take part, to be amongst all these other beautiful girls, and to experience the whole setup of, of, of being Miss South Africa. I didn't uh, go through the whole experience of being Miss South Africa. I left halfway through, because I went to the United States. I only had a few months of being Miss South Africa and then I was in the USA. Deesa Davenstein's beautiful hands paved her way to becoming Miss South Africa. Mitzi Stunder, who appeared in several local movies, died tragically in a car accident. Linda Collett now lives and models abroad, while Gillian Jessup became a blonde for the Miss World contest. Monica Ferrell followed. With hindsight, I, I now see the Miss South Africa experience as one of the most profound catalysts for change and for personal growth in my life. Because if you think of winning a beauty contest and being in something like the Miss Universe or the Miss World, it's a very extreme expression of woman as the body beautiful. And I thought, well, now what happens when, when I start to get older and all of these good looks are no longer available to me and things start to sag and droop and all of those things that inevitably happen to us. And it was really about saying, where is the real me? So I, I kind of reacted a bit extremely after that uh, Miss World competition and I cut all my hair off and I threw my makeup away and I even allowed myself to put on some weight. And it was really starting to look for the real moniker, the whole moniker, because we're not just physical beings, we're emotional beings, we're mental beings, and we're spiritual beings. And I believe that our journey in life is to try and bring all of those together. So I'm actually very grateful to the beauty contest experience, the, or the beauty contesting experience, for actually giving me that, that platform. Next came Stephanie Reinecker. My year as Miss South Africa was actually an awfully long time ago, but of course feels like yesterday. It was before the professional beauty pageant era and very much regarded as an adventure, a bit of a lark, although we did have sponsors and I did win lots of lovely prizes, including a car and a trip to the Far East and went to the Miss World pageant at the Royal Albert Hall in London, which was absolutely terrifying. There were 85 girls from all over the world uh, including this t tiny little South African contingent. And I think it was just the sheer size of things for an 18-year-old from Natal to go to, without the support that beauty pageants and beauty queens have today. We were virtually alone. Shelley Latham was crowned in 1973. Beauty Queen history was made when Annaline Creel was offered the Miss World crown after the reigning Miss World was disqualified. When I went to the Miss World competition, I think every girl that entered secretly wished that she could uh, crown. But when I was there and I was very much in love with my boyfriend, um, we were ecstatic when I came second because it didn't interfere with our life so much. And then about four or five days after that, the Miss World uh, organization came to me and said that the girl who won the Miss World had to resign and whether I would like to take the crown. With the abdication of Helen Morgan, who won the Miss World title by one point, 
The crown goes to Annaline Creel, Miss South Africa. Allemaal in die land is trots dat hierdie charmante blondine beskou word as die mooiste meisje in die wereld. En ons wens haar alle succes toe. And that was an extremely difficult decision because I was reconciled by the fact that I came second. I was happy with that. And uh, if I should now take the crown, it will change my life dram dramatically. Returning home to South Africa now as Miss World, Annaline Creel. Persconferentie gesels is al speel met Annelien. Welcome back to South Africa. It's good to see you. Vrij dank. Het is heerlijk om terug te wees. Annelien Creel crowned Vera Johns, who was kicked out of Miss World. 1975 also saw the start of South Africa being represented by two beauties, Gail Anthony and Vera Johns. When I went to the Miss World in November 1975, and the controversy started to build up, it appeared that I think the the, the actual um, the question was that how long had I lived in South Africa? Rhoda Radomir, third in the Miss South Africa competition, replaced Vera Johns, disqualified in the Miss World competition. Crystal Cooper was tweede, maar het die aanbod om as plaasvervanger op te tree van die hand gewees. I was, I think, upset that I, I couldn't take part. It was the night before the final night and um, I, I think that I had built up mentally, um, physically, you, you know, you've, you've got to be absolutely, absolutely prepared. And uh, it, it was a big blow, it, it, it was, but you know, you, you know, you've got a pair of square shoulders and you take it, take it on, uh, upon your shoulders and, 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 and walk, walk through. It was a tough time uh, emotionally, but I was able to have a, a good cry the night before. I think when Julia told me and said, look, I'm afraid I have to ask you to stand down because uh, these, this is what's at stake and, and um, perhaps having been a former Miss Rhodesia, that could have been a grey area. Now I look at my life now as, as a different phase in my life um, and I enjoy that because I think, uh, you know, you, you've, um, you've had your number of years in the city and, and your promotional aspect and you're now promoting um, what is now our, our, our stud farm and our racehorses and we breed racehorses uh, commercially. Cynthia Klaassen from the Cape and Lynn Massain from Natal won in 1976. I don't think you can ever put the Miss SA experience behind you because there's always somebody at some stage that is going to recognize you. Even to this day, I, at, at least once every fortnight, I can say someone will come up to me and say, are you Lynn Massain from South Africa? And of course, I know exactly how old they are because <laughs> they're from that generation. No, you can never put it behind you because um, it was such an integral part of my life and um, it always will be. When I went off to the Miss World um, contest, there were two. There was Miss South Africa, which is who was myself, and Miss Africa South, uh, Rosette Motsep. And off we went, two of us very excited and delighted to be going overseas for the first time. There was a huge, huge controversy because there were two of us from South Africa, one black girl and one white girl. and. Um, they, unbeknown to us, countries were pulling out every day. Over a dozen countries withdrew from the competition merely because we were in it. And we weren't allowed to withdraw. We had to um, hold our ground. And all the girls were withdrawing, and there were death threats and bomb threats, and we had personal bodyguards. So on one hand, it was very exciting to have all the attention, but on the other hand, it was very confusing because we didn't really, you know, to us, there was no fuss. We were just two girls going off to have a, a jolly good time. It was also the start of where the world was focusing on South Africa and the apartheid and um, you know the black and white issue, and um, that was probably the controversy. But you know we got through it and we had a wonderful time, the two of us. Uh, we were never allowed to be photographed together. We, there was always another girl in between us, another country in between us. We never understood that at the time either. We were both young girls were just going off together. You know, to us it wasn't an issue. Both the 1977 beauties Vanessa Wannenberg and Linus Fester now live in Australia. Margaret Gardner and Yolanda Kloppers highlighted 1978. There was great triumph when the vivacious Margaret Gardner was crowned Miss Universe. She's now married and lives in California. Yolanda Kloppers looks back. I was Miss South Africa 21 years ago, a very long time ago. Compared to now, it, it just seems such a vast difference 
I remember it being in the old Coliseum and um, and hundreds of people and you know and there was such a, you know a lot of excitement and you know but it was so small you know it wasn't on the big scale as it is now not at Sun City surely not all the prizes the girls get now surely not the exposure they get now I'm, I certainly do think that they have a wonderful advantage now I really worked hard a lot of dieting a lot of gymming a lot of elocution a lot of things that that you have to work towards to and um, Yes, I, I mainly did it to better myself, to give myself a better chance in life. Vanessa Wannenberg was the last girl to enter the Miss, the Miss World. And there was a lot of hoo-ha about the apartheid era, the apartheid in the country. And she had a terrible time during Miss World. And then Julia Morley said, South Africa cannot enter. A lot of countries boycotted South Africa. They sent me an invitation, but then said, uh, I can only attend and not and not enter in this world. It was a great disappointment. I thought that I would have done well. I, I really thought that. And uh, normally South African girls do very well in this world. Sunday Times journalist Doreen Levine has reported 18 Miss South Africa contests and chaperoned seven winners overseas. Vanessa Wannenberg's uh, was the unhappiest trip of all in the sense that she was so intimidated by learning that girls were being pulled off the stage by their governments because South Africa was on the stage. And it was a very, very unhappy, unhappy time for her. And after the, all the drama and the, and the sadness of realizing so many girls were sitting out of the competition and had been pulled out on the last day because she was still on the platform, she couldn't handle it. She, uh, it was a very, very distressing time. Um, and that was the end of us sending a Miss South Africa to Miss World until things cha changed in South Africa. And that evening, man oh man, it was something we'll never forget. Yolanda Kloppers, last year's winner. Ons het mos gesê, sê is die mooiste, maar jyvrou Zuid-Afrika 1979 is a prachtige blodine uit Kaapstad, Karen Sikkel. Two long-legged blondes snatched the 1979 beauty crowns. Karen Sikkel became the Sunday Times Miss South Africa and reports Veronica Wilson represented us at Miss Universe. Yes, often we were called we, together. Yeah, in fact, and sometimes multiply. Mm. And the nice thing was because we shared a sponsor at the, um, <coughs> at the time, so it was... Well, with the report newspaper, oh, we right. both belonged yeah. to reporters, right. and then I was also tied up with the Sunday Times. So it was nice because you had that backup, and you, you knew a familiar face, which was also nice. Because I also knew thrown extended out. that further. We formed our own little company called oh, Solid Pink, mm -hmm. which was about four of us: Vera, Yolanda, Karen, and myself. Mm -hmm. So we had many block bookings for all four mm -hmm. of us. It, it was a good year, but I had been a very successful model, and I enjoyed that kind of work. It was an easy job. I earned good money and then suddenly I was thrust into this job where I belonged to a lot of sponsors and I had a lot of bad publicity. I had a lifestyle which a lot of people didn't believe in and so I, in hindsight, it was great maybe if I'd known that it wouldn't, it, I would have had the kind of publicity that I had, maybe I wouldn't have done it, but in, in other spheres things have worked out great. Um, well, I have a similarity with Karen that we were both a professional models before and I'd been modeling overseas and um, earning good fees. And suddenly, first of all, you have a clothing sponsor who doesn't want you to do any other clothing company. Because they've given you this prize, they think they own you and they don't pay you hourly rate that you would normally get for modeling and you suddenly can't do any other clothing company for the whole year. So that's very expensive. <laughs> I found that very expensive. But um, I don't want to be negative. I had a lovely time. I went all over the country to places where I'd probably never otherwise see. Where we were mainly belonged to the newspapers, we were exploited in that, in that way and we had a lot of publicity and we were out and about. I think today it's a business and the girls are going out and they're making a good living. Veronica crowned her successor, Jenny Kay, who arrived in Seoul, South Korea, to find herself banned from Miss Universe for political reasons. Now married, she lives abroad. Sandra McChrystal's legs carried one million rand insurance. Well, I won the Miss South Africa in 1980, which is a good almost 20 years ago. I like to keep that part of it secret because people go, oh. 
Um, those 20 years have been a very eventful time for me. I do find that you can never really lose your title. People don't really want you to lose the title of Miss South Africa and they expect a tremendous amount from you. And being in the public eye, they're always looking out for something that can happen to you or, you know, they, they like to hear about you, they build you up a bit of media hype and then try and break you down again. But that's the bad side. And the competition has changed so much in the last couple of years. It's not the way it used to be then. The whole focus of the competition is not so much on beauty, it's more on community and being able to, um, you know, do something for your, for your country instead of just standing around being a pretty face. Although in my day, you know, people did expect you to have a brain. <laughs> I found that um, the year of 1981 was a bit of a shambles. Mm, it was. Because the RSA and the Miss SA competitions were being split. It wasn't really a good year. It, uh, it was a bad I thought, vintage. Yeah, I, there was no, there was nothing was organised. Um, nobody looked after us. Even when I went over to New York, you didn't go overseas. Mm -hmm. so, um, I didn't get a chaperone. There wasn't anything organised. And then when I got there, I was sidelined anyway because of the problems yeah, in the country. The politics, you know, my my whole um, presence there was in the balance. Um, and they were more interested in me as a political sort of Porn. debate rather than, you know, a participant in the, in the pageant. I we were just thrown. I, I I got the feeling that we were just sort of. I had. I, I think, for my side of it, I had a wonderful time because there was no Miss World for me mm. because we had been banned a couple of years beforehand. So I basically went overseas on a holiday. At the time, I thought, well, this is really going to open up doors for me. Um, but in retrospect, um, I don't think it really did. Because after that year was over, I changed course completely. My life took another direction. I've made my own career. I went back to university. I finished my degree. Um, and I got involved in a business. Um, and that's my life. Um, being Miss South Africa has had nothing to do with it. I've actually downplayed the whole fact that I was a Miss South Africa. Um, my daughter's eight years old, and she only discovered last year that mum was a Miss South Africa, which she's now terribly proud of. And the photos have been going backwards and forwards to school and to her mates. But it's, it's almost not an embarrassment that you were a Miss South mm. Africa, because people look at you and they think, she obviously doesn't have a brain cell in her head or she's just one of those beauty queens. And I didn't like feeling like that. The mothers of Sandra de Maia and Odette Scrooby were both beauty queens. You know, I was only 18 when I was crowned. I'd grown up on a farm. And after I won the contest, I had to actually come and live in Johannesburg, which was very difficult for me. But um, being a farm girl, I was quite tough, or I considered myself quite tough. And um, I just sort of learned to swim. I think the expectations now are different where the political situation has changed for the better. It was very difficult for me as an 18-year-old coming from a farm to explain why we had a political system the way it was. I think it was when I took part in the Miss Universe, it really was hard. As an 18-year-old, it was an emotional strain. People have no idea what you do go through there, and, sp and especially because it was held in a country where there was a civil war. You know, we were exposed as contestants to extreme poverty, and um, I really learned to become tough. Obviously, any young girl is keen to enter it, but I really didn't have the faintest idea that I'd ever win, and it, it was a bit of a shock, and I still think they might have made a mistake, or it was just luck, or a fluke, or the wrong number called out, but I don't regret it and it was a wonderful two years. I know it sounds strange, two years, but it was two years of a lot of fun. The negative things, I think people always believe that you're something that you're not. Even to this day, um, I'll be in a restaurant and someone will come and ask me, weren't you this Miss South Africa? And you know, why is your hair not all done? Or um, they, they expect something that doesn't exist. You know, you're just a human being. And I think people believe you're something that you're not and that gets to me a bit. I think that's the negative side is that, but you know, I chose to be in that, in that business, so I cannot criticize the people if they do. You've just got to be kind and nice, and, but I think people expect too much of you. 
Leanne Hosking won the title in 1983. She later married ex-Australian cricketer Mike Hazeman. I think the positive things are that you, uh, you have a fantastic year that not many girls in life actually experience. You meet wonderful people, you do very nice work, you make some money, you, you, know, you make your contacts and you can set up a platform for whatever you want to do next. But then there, there are also the negatives. The negatives of winning Miss South Africa for me are that it throws you completely off your chosen career path. And I still have a regret about that today because you never go back. You always say, I will, I will, but you don't. You get involved in all sorts of other things. I was studying law and I wanted to be a lawyer and I would still like to be a lawyer. The 1984 beauties were Letitia Sneeman, now living abroad, and Lorna Potgieter. Well, Miss South Africa for me, it changed my life completely. Um, one day I was a math school teacher and the day after I was crowned, I, you've got instant celebrity status and you're recognised and you've basically just got so many opportunities that are open to you that for me it was the biggest change in my life. Suddenly I was thrown in at the deep end with, with um, Miss South Africa title which has all the associated career opportunities following it um, and I was just lucky. I've used the Miss South Africa title to further my career which I'm doing today. Um, well, I uh, entered Miss South Africa three times um, because the first two times I came uh, runner-up and it's always been very important for me to, uh, to win the title. I've always uh, looked up to the Miss South Africa crown ever since I was a little girl, so that was a big, um, big goal that I set out for myself. Um, and when I did enter Miss South Africa in 1985, um, I won it after trying for the third time. And I let a couple of years go by, uh, about three years after uh, the Miss South Africa the title uh, 1988 I decided to um, enter the Miss Germany contest and that all came about because I speak German at home I have a, a German passport and I had on a number of occasions worked in Germany so it uh, wasn't a problem and of course through the Miss Germany contest I was able to enter uh, Miss Universe so I finally got to the Miss Universe contest so I had a lot of uh, people wondering, well, what is she about? She's leaving South Africa and uh, she wasn't proud to be Miss South Africa, but it, it wasn't like that at all. I think uh, Miss South Africa was always something I'd, I'd dreamt about entering and uh, it was a very big thing in my life and it sort of put the cherry on top. Um, but because I couldn't participate, I couldn't get any further. Um, that is why I really wanted to uh, enter the Miss Germany contest and that was a way for me to get to um, an international competition. Well, I suppose the best memory of all is the moment that you win, which is just so fabulous and such fun and wonderful for my whole family. Um, and then after that, it's a bit of a whirlwind, really. But it gave me a confidence that I know I wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, and it opened doors for me that I know wouldn't have been opened otherwise. I missed out on this world and this universe, and. Yes, if I have a regret, it's that. I would have liked to have seen how far I could have, I could have got in that field. But all in all, there was plenty to keep me busy at home. I think you learn after you've entered to uh, value your privacy. It's not something that you, anybody can prepare you for, is your loss of privacy. And when you, once you've lost it, then you want it back. But yes, I think it's fair comment to say that if you're going to put yourself on a pedestal, then expect to be knocked off it a few times. The morning I woke up before the judging, I just thought, well, this is the day. You're going to have a great chat with everybody else. It's not an exam. You can't fail it. There's no failing in this business. There's only a winner. That's all. And that's how I approached it, and I just enjoyed it. I think it was my age. To be quite honest, if they didn't choose me, they would have been very silly. <laughs> no. I think it was my age, the fact that I had a degree, the fact that I have, have been well-traveled at that stage already, have been fairly self-confident, had good, very good general knowledge because I was interested in whatever affairs was happening, you know, daily affairs. Um, maybe maturity, and I never regret entering, but I gained a lot of experience as a person but it was a very, very tough year. Janine Botbell became a happily unmarried mother. Michelle Bruce had to overcome anorexia and other obstacles during her controversial reign. Suzette van der Marwe has remarried and lives in Miami. Janine Botbell's sister, Diana Tilden Davis, came third when Miss World lifted the ban. 
Amy Kleinhans was the first Miss South Africa after our racial laws changed, allowing all South Africans to enter. I was approached by my agency at the time. I was a university student and um, I've been modeling just for part-time money at the time and they asked me, Amy, you've been with us for a while. Why don't you enter the Miss South Africa? And I said, actually, now you're going down the wrong road. <laughs> I'm not a beauty queen. I've never envisaged to be. I've never entered another competition, any other beauty competition in my life. Why would I want to do the Miss SA? And I actually entered in 1991. And I was runner up to Diana Tilton Davis. And then in 1992, I re-entered because that was the official last year I could enter because of my age. And I won Miss SA in 92, August 92, when I was 24. Politics was a big thing in my, in my year that they were looking for. Whether you were competent um, with uh, speaking to politicians, whether you understood the dynamics of what was happening in South Africa. When I went to Egypt, for instance, I had to go and see the Minister of Trade and Tourism and speak to him about renewing bridges with uh, Egypt and South Africa. So I think they were looking for a completely different dynamic in a girl and also a more, a very good, well-balanced girl. She had to have a little bit of the prettiness and a little bit of the charm and a little bit of the sensibility and a good all-rounder. And I suppose in 1992, I was it. <laughs> Sowetan born Jackie Moffa Kang came second in the Miss World contest. When I did enter, I didn't even tell anybody. I just went to the Sunday Times, took a picture and filled the form in. And I didn't expect to get this far. Maybe that's the reason why I enjoyed it so much. And when I did win, um, it was a shock. I actually don't remember that moment because I went blank, totally. I was the first black Miss, I am the first black Miss South Africa. Um, so there were a lot of controversial interviews. I mean, people asking me ridiculous questions. Um, but, but I handled them okay. I don't know how. I always say that because there is a God, you always get through things that you never thought that you'd get through. There were a lot of people who were accepting, but there were other people who could not accept having miss, a black Miss South Africa. Um, there were times when I did um, um, a radio show. This is just one example. I was um, on 702. And a lot of people are calling in and really uh, congratulating me on, on, on having won. But there were still some people, well, one, one woman in particular from Benoni, she called in and she said, oh, Jackie, well, I don't think that she's a good Miss South Africa. She has big teeth and a big bum. Okay, but that's stereotype. I don't have a, I don't have a big bum, but, but because I was a black woman, she expected me to have a big bum. And that's what she said on national, tele, on national radio. Um, so there were some people who were really spiteful towards me because I'm black, not because of me as a person. I entered Miss South Africa. It was just a spur of a moment decision, really. I didn't intend to do it. It's actually my mother and my sister who forced me to enter it. My sister entered it in 1992. She had such a ball of a tie, and she, said, and she got Miss Personality. And she always said to me, well, I should have won, so what's going to happen? You're going to grow old, and you're going to win this title for me. The most positive thing that's come out of me having been crowned Miss South Africa in 1994 is... is Actually, there's so many things that I could, I could name. But for one, it gave me an opportunity that I know I otherwise wouldn't have had in terms of um, where my career is at the moment. And uh, I think I was crowned at a very significant time as well in South Africa in 1994. Democracy was just, had just been born and there were so many changes happening. And I was part and parcel of that. I was given an opportunity to experience something that no institution could teach you. But I think over and above everything that happened to me in that year, it gave me an opportunity of a lifetime. It was like a launching pad, really, to, to achieve greater things and to move on to doing even um, bigger things, so to speak. I want to look back 10, 20, 30 years from now and, and be glad that 1994 happened for me, that the year that I was crowned was significant, but, and that my life changed for the better. It'd be a great um, distress, so to speak, if I look back and I ha I've hated my life because of my South Africa. The lineup of most essays for the past 25 years 
is a reflection on exactly what the society is doing. Some are divorced, some have seven children, some are not married by 42, some are out of the country. they mothers of three and they, they've got their own careers going. They've moved on from their teenage years. And many people actually don't realize that many of the girls were chosen at 18, 19 years of age. And now they, they're 38 years old. And that was something they've done, been there, literally designed the T-shirt. And now that they choose to not be in the limelight, um, I think that's their own prerogative. And um, stop being so hard on us. And that, I think, also brings in why many of the South Africans um, choose not to be interviewed. They choose not to be exposed. I think you don't have a choice. You ca uh, I've always said that you're your own manager, but you cannot just cut off the public. You were a public figure. Um, people look up to you, um, you chose to be in this field, um, you re represented a country and they feel that, that you're part of, part of their life. I do think I owe the public of South Africa. First of all, they gave me a wonderful year. Secondly, up till today, um, they received me well. But there's also a cutting off point. I will do certain charitable functions with pleasure. But I also, my life has changed as such that I have a family, I have a husband and I have a child and I'm going to have a second child. So that comes first. I think as in the South Africa, you're, you're a national asset and, 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 and that alone, I, well, I speak for myself, you do feel that you have a duty to the public. Um, not, really, you, not that you're obligated, but it's a personal thing. For me, I feel that I have a duty to the, to the South African community at large because, firstly, of the support they've given me. Well, I've never allowed um, public opinion to affect my life in any way. Um, I would say a great big thank you to the public of South Africa for all the support they've given me over many, many years. They've certainly kept me on my toes, I suppose. And it's wonderful when people come up to me and ask me if I'm Penny Coolen or if I'm related to Penny Coolen. And they have just been really very, very supportive and very wonderful. And I can only thank them. Um, you know, in the, in the early days when Penny won and many after me, we won by public vote. And I think that is something that's been taken away from the, the true meaning of being a Miss South Africa. You have not been chosen by Miss South Africa anymore. You've been chosen by Dable Hasseldorf and, and, and some famous person from overseas, which really has no relativity to me um, as being uh, the, the girl that the, the South Africans have chosen. Yeah, I think what Moya Mika said is a lot of truth in it because, you know, it is, um, you are representing your country and why not give the people of the country the chance to vote for you? You know, when I won the competition and I think when Penny won the competition and, and possibly people in, in, the, in the 60s and, and, and 70s, I think we entered the competition because we believed we were beautiful enough to win it and, beautiful, and, and our beauty was, was you know, general enough, inner and outer and intellectual beauty too. But I might be called a beauty queen because I'm not a beauty queen, I'm a pageant winner, <laughs> I'm so adamant about that. Um, who look at pageant winners as brainless people who are not capable of doing anything but wave and smile and that's not true. Uh, we did have a life before then and we do have a, we did have a life during our reign at Miss South Africa and we do have a life now and brain. I would like to believe that I wasn't chosen only on looks. Um, I'd like to believe that I was chosen on my intelligence. <laughs> Sometimes the pressure of being in the limelight is quite hard and it's quite nice when you get married and you can now hide behind another name or when you get a bit older people don't always recognize you but they do recognize you sometimes when you least want them to, like when you're pushing your trolley around the supermarket or something. They, they, they needed, they were short of girls in Durban. So the, the friend of mine was the PR lady for um, Rapport, and she said, oh, won't you just send a photograph, and we just need more entrance. So I, I entered, and then I found I was involved in the regional finals, and then I was Miss Natal, and then I was entered, and then I was entering in the Miss South Africa. And I, I, I think I was the only one among the finalists who had a university degree, and I think they were worried at that time because there was so much politics involved with the Miss World, and they wanted somebody who they thought could handle all the interviews. I think that they've combined the beauty pageant with really sort of more of an ambassadorial role today, which is maybe not totally, um, totally focused on beauty. I don't know if it's a different era, but I still feel that Beauty queens are beauty queens, but I, I feel that there's something lacking in the beauty queens these days. Um, the, it's all in the 
actual pageantry of it. You know, I might not have been the most beautiful of the Miss South Africa's or have married the richest man or... But I'm very, very happy in myself and I'm happy with my life and I love my kids and I feel fulfilled with my, my business and my life. And so for me, it's, it's just a very natural thing to be able to remember being Miss South Africa and, and maintaining it because it was a wonderful experience. I think that you change the set of judges and the next day put the same girls in that situation and somebody else will win. It's just, you know, it's your lucky day. It's in the eye of the beholder. It's the way you answer the questions on the day. And you know what? It's not the most beautiful girls in South Africa who are in the Miss South Africa competition. Walk down the streets of Cape Town or on the beaches of Durban, you will see far more beautiful girls. There are millions of pretty girls in the world, in the country. You just go to Clifton Beach, you'll pick up 10 in five minutes. But you have to then go further from those pretty girls, choose now somebody who can do the job. What pulled me through was um, probably my ability to communicate. communicate with the judges. I think that's what mm. did it for me, because I was by no means the most beautiful girl there. This is a very interesting um, question, because it is a beauty contest. And as in some instances with certain people are anti-beauty contests, and it's for some people, you know, the Nutties woman and the feminists and whatever, they don't like it. And they've tried to cover it up a little bit and turn it into sort of, you know, you're an ambassador and, and let's not have swimwear competitions and take that away and whatever. And I think that's completely wrong. You have to be true to it. It is a beauty contest. Obviously, you have to be intelligent. You have to have PR skills, be able to hold a conversation, do um, certain public speaking engagements. But at the end of the day, you also have to be good looking and you have to have a good body. And if I judge a competition, I want to see that girl in swimwear. It, it is a beauty contest. I mean, that is what it is. And, and if you don't like that, don't enter and don't watch it. Obviously, you can't sort of be an airhead, but I mean, that's the main focus. You, you can't hide from that. I think people like to put too much emphasis these days on the fact that they're looking for brains and they're looking for all these intelligence and all this sort of thing. Yes, I think a girl has to have more to offer than just a pretty face. Um, but first and foremost, you're representing your country in an international pageant and everybody's looking at you as a beauty queen. So I still think beauty is obviously something which is a major part. Um, I think more important than um, necessarily brains and how many degrees you've got. We had entered this competition because it was a beauty competition but now they seem to want to call themselves something else as if they're actually ashamed of the fact that you've you know that they are a beauty queen who's been in a bathing costume and been in a parade and, and done all the things that beauty queens do. So I have difficulty in, in actually um, you know understanding why they're not just happy to be Miss South Africa and why they're need to have the extra, extra PhD that they're an ambassador, they, you know, they're not. If you, if you don't want to call it a beauty contest and you want to make as though, you know, you, you're just a great ambassador and you're there for your country and the looks don't matter and the body doesn't matter and it's all about how wonderfully intelligent you are, then you must call it Miss Ambassador or Miss something else. You mustn't call it Miss South Africa or Miss Venezuela or Miss Universe or Miss World. One lady came up to me and you could see she was a really fair cramped Afrikaans lady, really. And she came up to me and she, she took my hand and she said, Jackie, you know, I remember when you were crowned, I thought that the world had come to an end. These are her words. She says, I'm a racist Afrikaans woman. And I hated that moment, but I'll be honest with you. You have done South Africa really proud. I am so proud of you and I'm glad that you missed South Africa. I cried. I cried right there with the cameras and everything. I couldn't. I couldn't. I cried. I mean, even now I have tears in my eyes. How could I defend apartheid in those days? There were many questions which I just wished I could have just run a mile and run home because I just wasn't prepared to answer those questions. In my time, no. I can honestly say, look, there was a lot of negative things in that. There's a lot of jealousy. There's a lot of bitchiness. Um, people are always trying to pull you down or see you fall. And when you're in the public eye, people want to see you fall. They're actually waiting for you to fall so that they can rub their hands together in glee and say, oh, look, it's not all so wonderful, is it, you know? Oh, there's plenty of wrong moves that I made. Uh, most of them, I think, is trusting people too easily. From the moment Annalene Creel became Miss World, she was treated as royalty. The public, including the press, was obsessed with her private life and demanded to know everything about her lifestyle. But I always quite like those 
hard moments, those terrible moments, because I find I really sort of looked into myself, I really sort of emotionally grow. Because you're supposed to be a celebrity, which is this country's celebrity, but I think anywhere else in the, in the world, a Miss South Africa or a Miss World or whatever is not really a celebrity, it's just another person, because there's so, there's so many other celebrities around. But um, I think the, the stigma is attached that, that you rely on your looks, you rely on on things that God's given you, but you don't rely on you as a person, and you rely on your outer beauty and not your inner beauty. People didn't take me seriously. I mean, I'm a pharmacist, I'm a woman of 28, and I've just done modeling, and I've just done a Rainus Miss South Africa. Why don't they take you seriously? Why don't they think you can actually achieve anything else than just be a beauty queen? But I found that it was extremely frustrating, especially from the male population to be taken seriously. The men sort of just laughs you off and then the women are hypercritical. The girls are, are very professional now and they make sure that their, 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 their figures, their face, their hair, their elocution, the, the total package of how they present themselves is very professional now far more than it was in, the, in, you know, you were probably looking for a, a lovely, new, fresh, natural beauty, sort of not off the farm or, or, or someone new, but now those girls who enter are totally prepared. You won't floor flaw them. Mm -mm. In those days, we made no money out of being Miss South Africa at all, whereas today it's a business. At the time, I was earning, I think it was 500 rand an hour. And that's 12 years ago, so 500 rand an hour went a long way 12 years ago. We had fabulous prizes. At the time, they were considered unbelievable, as today's prices, prizes are considered incredible. And um, we, I won a car, and you are sponsored literally from top to toe. The total of my prizes was, was 70,000 rand, which is comparable to today, you're dealing with a million rand, I think. It's absolutely huge, and yeah, it's much bigger today, so I'm, t I'm talking for us older girls. But I didn't really get, I didn't get a car, <laughs> like every winner gets. We never got paid for anything. No, we didn't. I remember I was sponsored by Bristol Myers, who we had got shape. It was a shape drink that you mixed with milk, and I had to eat that. <laughs> and then I couldn't afford the milk that I had to buy in the hotel, so eventually I went on to sustagen because you could mix that with water. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have to eat. We didn't get a lot of money. Food. I mean, I think my total Mine was winnings might have come rand. to 30,000 if you add up the car. car. Which you didn't have money to put petrol yeah. in. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was no income, you know. Um, most of the shoots you were doing, For okay, they were flying you around free of charge and sorting out the accommodation, but there was no cash involved. Handling over. Um, you were actually just working for Bristol Myers Alfa Romeo yeah, for your sponsors paying back uh, for the car and you know whatever it is that we won I won my first car when I was 16 and I remember winning it and I didn't have a driver's license I had to actually get my father I had to fly down to the coast and come and drive my car back up to Johannesburg for me and I just thought it was an easy and a fun way of making money and if I look at the girls that's won in recent years and I see how they grow through the year it's fantastic to see that you know it's that they really get schooled and skilled and refined through the year and at the end of the year they're actually far more interesting and more beautiful than they were when they started but I guess that just comes with age and experience these are some of our lovely girls, the famed, the fated, and the forgotten. Some spoke to us, and some refused. But for our racial laws, we could have seen an entirely different lineup of beauties. While the media reflected their glamour and excitement, behind the scenes, they often dealt with tears, anger, and starvation. Doors leading to dream careers and wealthy marriages swung open for some, but they all shared the same coveted title, Miss South Africa. I'd say the majority of people in my life today don't even know I was Miss South Africa and I don't want them to know. 100%. Because then they measure me against that. Not only that, it wasn't a priority. It was a job that we were lucky enough to be able to do, chosen to do. We did it, and now we're doing other things. We've been criticized by people like, can I say it? By other beauties. Janie Allen, okay? 
Oh. I discovered from the newspaper she had entered and her entry landed up on the floor, never got to the final, so nobody ever knows she entered. But she's the first to criticize. She is a reporter. She's intellectual. She is cognitive. We are dumb beauty queens. 100%. Unfair. I went to the same university as her, I've got the same degree. I won, she landed up on the cutting mm. floor, but she can stand and criticize. Sour grapes often. Mm. <laughs> but I also want to say that I have found one or two ladies that were queens still want to be queen and still behave That's queen another problem. and still mm. do queen. Mm. Mm. Uh, and, and the you... priorities are, well, I, I just cannot give up mm. on this mm. beauty queen, on the image, on mm. the looks, and, and this is their life. I think first thing, if you want to enter the South Africa pageant, try to have a career or some form of qualification because it is only 12 months and it does end and you need to know where you're going to be or where you're going to what you're going to do post um, your Miss South Africa title. I still believe that there, there has never been a Miss South Africa that experienced what I experienced and there will never be a Miss South Africa that will experience what I experienced. For me it was a unique time, it was, uh, it was, it was a unique experience. John Casablancas, when I won Miss South Africa, he was a judge and he had a classic statement. He said, I was looking for a girl who would walk into a room and make heads turn. And I think that sums up what a Miss South Africa really is. It's a girl who when she walks and people should notice her and she should have something worthwhile to say. Um, she doesn't have to compete with the chairman of a leading company, but she, she needs to know how to hold a conversation and to hold her own in a room of educated people. But she doesn't need to be a rocket scientist.